taking a week or two to window shop so you gain perspective on your target market and your target opportunities so you know what a good deal is and a bad deal is, what they list for versus what they sell for, will give you so much more confidence as a buyer to go out and make offers that you know are fair deals. Because like, look, like I know Water the Region. My partner, Matt, knows Water the Region. I can go on the MLS right now and be like, this would be a good deal at this price. This would be a bad deal at this price for pretty much any property that's on the market. But me saying that and what I think is a good deal is much different than what a buyer would think is a good deal. Legit, this stuff works. So if you don't clearly have your goals set out, or if you don't know how to get your goals clarified, or you don't even know what that means, like come talk to me. Like building an action plan is something that we've done with hundreds of clients. Uh, and the ones that are successful are the ones that look at the action plan and get very specific on all of the details. YouTube, it's Rebecca Lynn Matheson here, aka the Canadian Cottage Girl, and I'm joined here by Zach Britton from the Phipps Britton Realtor team, and he's actually a realtor in the Waterloo region as well as a real estate investor, so he comes with a wealth of knowledge here to bring you some market updates and really just some insight into what's going on in the Waterloo region. Welcome to the channel, Zach. How you doing? I'm doing good today, Rebecca. Thanks for having me on again. Everybody that's been on the channel has been super awesome. We've had some great feedback some great comments had a chance to do some some deals with some people as well as get on some phone calls and, and discuss really their, their real estate plans and anything about water the region so we really appreciate everybody that's been reaching out and, and for you and the rest of the team for hosting us here uh, we're excited to get into it absolutely well let's jump right into some of the stats and just go over kind of what's been happening in the water waterloo region throughout the course of the christmas break and beyond and then we'll get into yeah. some nitty-gritty as to strategies now that the market is where it's at absolutely so i'll pull up the presentation right now we'll get Perfect. that going awesome so we're going to talk about the waterloo region real estate market you guys already know why you're here just a quick overview, Rebecca, and the rest of you, what we're gonna go through. So if you guys aren't interested in some of this stuff, you know where to skip to. Market review first. So the you know, last time we were on, we were talking a lot about more specific deals that we were working on, uh, as well as projects that us and clients had on the go. Um, you know, burning some multi-units, doing some um, duplex conversions, potentially some tiny home projects. Um, we are gonna go through that today. I wanna get you guys more up to speed on what's happened kind of since that November, December, up to about, you know, kind of that Jan, Feb in 2022, as well as what to expect in 2022. Um, you know, Rebecca, I know you guys have a, a lot of investors, a lot of, you know, real estate minds that, that are on the, the shows here and on your channel. Um, you know, making predictions is, is just that, it's just a prediction, but I just want to share with everybody kind of what are expectations and why those are expectations. Um, I think this would be really valuable for anybody that is either already owned property or invested or considering coming to our market, you know, in the next six to eight months. Uh, again, no crystal balls here, guys, but we'll give you some information and some insight to what we're seeing. Next, we're going to go through buyer and seller strategies. So if you're a buyer, uh, whether it's first time buyer, you know, coming from a different city or, you know, upsizing or downsizing, just some general strategies that you guys can kind of take home and consider as well as selling strategies. If you're selling off your, some of your portfolio or if you're selling your personal residence, um, just some, you know, food for thought to, to really take into consideration to execute if you really want to take advantage of the market we're in. And then the good stuff for investors at the bottom, we're going to just talk about investing strategies for the rest of 2022. And then at the very end, we'll discuss our investor hot list. So stay tuned for that. That is going to be gravy for you guys. Getting right into it though, Rebecca, uh, 2022 so far. So this is about first, second week of Feb, guys. Um, volume of sales is up, which is kind of crazy to think about because all we can hear about is how supply is down. I cannot say this enough, supply is super, super low. The amount of available listings in water the region is like two weeks of inventory. So, you know, if buyers were, you know, left to their own devices and there was no new listings coming up, we'd be out of homes to sell by the end of February. 
Um, it's been like this for a few months now. We've had under a month of inventory for, you know, 16, 17 months in a row, I believe it is now here in Waterloo region. Uh, and this is pushing values up uh, and then demand, you, you can see, I just kind of left it there because it's staying strong. Um, we'll get to the demand part in, in a little bit, but this is 2022 so far. Last year in January of 2021, uh, in a lot of markets in Southern Ontario and specifically in Waterloo region, we saw almost about a hundred thousand, you know, dollar jump in the average price of a detached home. Um, you know, the overall average price has jumped a little less than a hundred thousand, but still a crazy jump for a 30 day to 60 day window. Nonetheless, uh, we've seen the same thing in, in early 22 here. So for anybody that is currently looking or making plans to look, um, this is really the current status of the market. A lot of properties being moved, but they're selling very quickly and new homes can't come up quick enough to, to meet up with the demand. Um, and that kind of brings us just to some key factors. And I know if, if you guys have watched some of the other videos, uh, a lot of the other, um, you know, realtors and a lot of the other people that you guys have had come on and talk about markets, um, about just the overall investment landscape in, in Ontario, um, you know, interest rates, inventory, develop, um, i.e. developments um, have been kind of big topics and common topics. It, I don't know what's happening with interest rates, but they really only have one way to go. Um, do I think interest rates are going to cool local real estate markets, Rebecca? I think that is a question that a lot of people are going to ask themselves. Um, the reality is even if interest rates do go up, which I expect them to, I do not think that that let's say negative impact on buyer, let's say value or buying power will cause such a decline in demand that supply will be able to catch up. So that was a long way of saying, I don't think interest rates rising even a few times this year will deter enough buyers to cool our markets. Yeah, and as you had mentioned, and I think this is a common theme across most of the markets that we're seeing right now, it's just inventory is so low. So regardless of if interest rates change, people still need housing. People still need that inventory. And if, if there's not enough to cover, as you said, two weeks of inventory, if there's not enough to cover the demand, that's not going to change things all that much. Again, we don't have crystal balls, but I, I don't think your, your uh, kind of estimation here is, is too far off. Yeah. And if I kind of go the complete opposite way of what I think is going to happen or what I'm expecting to happen, um, let's say interest rates do rise and demand becomes so low and supply becomes so high that prices start to fall. And there's this magical, um, you know, bubble burst or um, correction that, uh, you know, this corner of the real estate market and investors and people have been, you know, waiting for. And I can't blame them. You know, these are people that have probably seen a lot of economic factors continue to get, you know, squeezed like interest rates, like inventory. Um, I think that even if there is some sort of correction or there is some sort of in massive increase in supply, um, I don't think prices will get to a point that are just so low that it's, it's just so such a steal. It's just so low that it makes so much sense. Even if we took a 10 to 20% dip in, in real estate values across the board in our market, we're still at the same price as we were at last year. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a really important point. I think Zach is that like, even if we have a huge de decline in the price points, it's just bringing us back to where we were at because we've had such an increase. We've had such a large increase and this kind of comes into development time and cost. I, I don't want to get too far into this. I we've touched on it in previous videos, but it, it's very time consuming and expensive for developers to develop land. And I don't know this for a fact, but consider this, you're a developer, Rebecca, uh, you have a thousand units you can release this year. Well, why would I release all thousand of those units if I know I can make a hundred thousand more per unit if I release half them this year and then half them next year? Right. Right. There is there. There may be other look developers and builders there. I'm sure they're doing just fine. But logistical uh, issues and time constraints have affected them for sure. Um, you know, reduced labor as well. It's tough to get good labor and it's tough to get skilled trades. So like developers aren't necessarily as motivated to, to bring new units to market as quickly as possible because they know they can sell them for a dollar today, but they can sell them for a dollar 10 tomorrow. So mm -hmm. um, that, that is something just to consider. And it is just kind of the nature of the, the Canadian real estate market, specifically here in Southern Ontario and Waterloo region. Um, and that goes into GTA influence. I was really, guys, anybody here from the GTA or anybody here that has you know, come to Waterloo region from the GTA, I need something way more catchier than GTA influence. 
because I was trying to think of a way to explain or describe in like one or two words how a larger, more expensive market like the greater Toronto area will consistently feed people to a market like Waterloo Region, right? This is going to continue to happen. You know, a, a lot of the channels, you know, originate from people down in the London markets as well. Same things happening in London. People will come from the GTA markets, the Waterloo Region area, and people from Waterloo Region area will come down to the London markets, vice versa. It's, it's, it's going to continue to happen. People who have made good money or no longer need to work and live in the GTA can buy almost double the house in Waterloo Region than what they could get in the GTA. Um, we've had a lot of people in, in, who have bought, you know, maybe a condo or, uh, you know, a property in the GTA have done very well on it in the last few years and just see how expensive those prices are. You know, and they're calling myself and Matt saying, hey, you know, we, we've done really well on our property in the GTA. We got a ton of equity, like, you know, can we invest in Waterloo Region? Um, that is really common in terms of people reaching out to us. And a lot of our clients um, have done just that. So the GTA influence is going to continue to feed demand here in the Waterloo Region. And, and I can't blame them. Waterloo Region has really turned over in the last 10, 15 years as a pretty desirable place to live. And it's about an hour and a half away from anywhere in the GTA. Absolutely. Yeah, I think all those points are really important, especially in the GTA, as we see people just gaining a ton of equity and wanting to do something with that. And that's actually a great play is whether or not you're helping out, you know, your millennial child buy their first house somewhere yeah. else and pulling out that equity or also whether or not you're actually investing it. Yeah, totally. I think that we've, we've seen a lot of those trends coming from the GTA, but it's a good move. You're able to use that equity to actually put it to work rather than it just sitting in your home. Yeah, and I don't want to get too far on that one because we will touch on that kind of strategy before we wrap up uh, this video yeah. today. Um, this is going to be real quick, guys. You know, I'm a real creative individual, as you can tell. Broken record here. 2022 expectations is the exact same as kind of where we're at now. Uh, regardless if interest rates increase and demand starts to cool, hypothetically speaking, guys, interest rates rise less buyers can buy or afford to buy what they want to buy or they get priced out of the market or they can no longer get financing because the loans are now too expensive for them. doesn't make sense, right? Even if that happens, uh, the volume of sales I expect to stay up and set new records this year. There's more people moving to Waterloo Region. There's more units in Waterloo Region because it's grown, more units will sell. Uh, supply is going to remain low. It's still down very low. Um, best case scenario, we get more supply. Buyers and sellers are a little bit more of an even market. But I suspect we may have, you know, one to two months this year where buyer competition isn't insane. Other than that, expect to compete for, for properties if you're a buyer. Uh, and I expect values to continue to increase. Um, a big jump in January, yep. Um, you know, follow the seasonal trends, generally speaking. Prices will reach, average prices will reach their peak in the spring. Um, they may depress a little bit in the summer. Uh, and then they'll probably come up a little bit more towards the middle of the fall and end up kind of where they're going to be. Uh, the end of February or the end of November, end of December this coming year. So uh, seasonal trends will apply this year. I don't expect COVID to shift seasonal trends like they did two years ago, but um, I expect the same thing. So we're just going to, expectations are the same guys. I don't think our markets are going to be any different by the end of the year. Um, I expect volume to, to remain high, supply to be low and values to go up. Um, so this part of the video guys uh is specifically for sellers so one thing that we haven't talked about for people here in waterloo region um and why i wanted to go over the kind of stats and expectations first rebecca is so that anybody whether you're considering doing any real estate business kind of has an idea of what type of market we're in we're in a really competitive market for buyers and a really strong market for sellers because inventory is low and a lot of people want to buy here in waterloo region so for anybody considering selling, so this could be, you know, maybe you're selling primary residence or you're selling, uh, you know, maybe one of your properties or part of your, your portfolio. Um, this is kind of just overall strategies, guys. So if you're selling a property and you need to move like primary residence, um, consider buying or selling first, right? Uh, buying first, I would stress buying first if you are looking for a very rare property or a very competitive property or in a very specific area. So maybe there's a few blocks or a few neighborhoods that you would consider moving to. If that's the case, then you're looking for something specific, right? Then consider buying first because buying first may be a little bit more challenging because it's going to be more competitive or more rare to find the property, right? Uh, selling first is more encouraged and we typically advise our sellers to sell first if they need a specific price point or if they need to lock in their financing to go purchase a new home. Now, selling first 
typically best case scenario, and this is just general averages. We're, we're talking average numbers here. Best case scenario, you, you try and plan to list and sell your place right before the middle of the spring market. And this is typically where prices are pretty much at their peak on average, but there isn't as many homes on the market that your listing would have to compete with, right? Regardless if it's a multi-unit, a condo, a detached home, whatever it is in our area, typically about a month before the middle of spring to like two weeks before the middle of spring is like perfect because you have lots of buyers that are thinking, no, it's nice enough outside, the snow's melted, grass is starting to get green. You know, if we're gonna move this year, we should probably start looking. That's where you see the majority of buyer demand and you have that kind of window where there's not the most listings that are gonna be on the market because the last thing you want, look, and this is like really, really specific details, guys. The last thing you want as a seller is you put your home on the market and then you know three days later, one of your neighbors puts their home on the market too. They are now taking buyers and offers from your property. So try to avoid that as much as possible. And then if you're selling in a market that has fewer options available to buyers, you can typically set better terms. So if to sell first, but you still have to go buy, put a long close on it, put a 90 plus day closing on it. You can probably negotiate that because you're getting multiple offers. And I'm sure there's an offer that's suitable in price that you could also negotiate a longer closing date. And at the end of the day, if you don't get what you want, you don't have to end up selling it, but just some general strategies that we like to apply for sellers that are thinking ahead. This gives you a lot more control. Furthermore, if you're selling, you can also start shopping for your property while you prep your home to market. Right. So like Rebecca, you know, you, you put your home on your market. We, you know, we get our stager to do a consultation. We're going to get it cleaned up, get any patch or any small work done. Then we're going to get this, the property fully staged, full media package done. You know, we can turn that around in a few days, but typically if you're not under the gun, you can take a few weeks to do that. And you go and you start shopping anyway. This gets you as a buyer an understanding on what's available in your market, gets your perspective. Cause I know like with, with people that have made a move recently, gaining perspective on where your target properties fit into the market is super valuable. So if, if that's an option for you, then you can still start shopping before you put your home on the market. It helps you be prepared. Um, on the other side of things, if you guys have to buy a property, start shopping and then prepare your property for market while you shop. Another thing, Rebecca, I think you guys have had a few people on this channel talk about it is either off market or exclusive listings as well. Um, I won't go too deep into that, but a strategy that we've executed on for, for people that are selling property and buying at the same time is, okay, we decided we want to buy first, right? Let's go shopping. We're going to go view a bunch of properties. We get your ready, home ready for market, but you can also shop your, your property exclusively before you put it on the MLS if that's what you want to do. So you can set your price in your terms and you can basically just allow your real estate agent. And we've done this for clients too is we've taken their exclusive listing and shopped it to our database, shopped it to people in our brokerage, other agents that we know that have buyers that are looking for that type of property. And you can basically set your price in your terms because in exchange for getting the property off market, you're getting the terms that you want, long close, premium price, other terms that you want in the offer um, because the buyer won't have to compete for it. So just some strategies for some sellers that I think could be useful and that we've applied. So if sellers are thinking ahead, consider using some of these. Love that. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand what you're looking to accomplish and then just gear your strategy based off of this. So I really, really appreciate the background there. Now, in terms of like, say buying right now, what are the things that a buyer would need to come in with? So <clears throat> like, what kind of deposit are we talking to make Ooh, the offer question. actually like competitive or to make a uh, like listing agent and the seller actually look at the offer? Good question. Good question. Good question, Rebecca. It's like you looked at my slides beforehand. It's a little <laughs> sneaker. So the, 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 that's a really good question. So deposits have really increased significantly. And um, a deposit is typically part of your, not typically, it's part of your down payment, guys. So if you're a buyer and you know, you're going out and purchasing under a million, let's say, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50,000 is a very common deposit. So you have that check, you know, ready in your bank account as you're going out and making offers with your real estate agent. And once you get an accepted offer, you go give them the deposit then within the next day, right? Um, that's typically what you do. But as a buyer, like getting that accepted offer is, is, the, is the trickiest part. And you kind of alluded that to um, Rebecca is um, getting an accepted offer is the trickiest part because you're competing with other buyers right now. And we work with a lot of buyers. We've built our business on buyers. Um, I myself am a buyer too, you know, I, I buy real estate. So um, 
applying some of the strategies that we've used to help get accepted offers. And maybe that's something that we can touch on more in depth in another video, or if people need to reach out and hop on a conversation is what types of clauses and what types of things can you do before you offer to still keep yourself protected, but also allowing you to bring a competitive offer that could get accepted. So it's this fine line between, I have to beat out all the other people, but I still don't want to overpay for a property. And I'm sure, you know, even yourself and other people you've worked with and, and people that have watched the videos and left some comments, you know, I, I'm looking at them and I, even on other videos, right? And a, a big concern for buyers is I got to beat 10 other buyers to buy the home I want. That means I'm overpaying, right? Well, it can, you can definitely overpay for property if that's what you want to do, but making sure one, you looked at comparable sales. Two, you have viewed enough properties that are comparable to that one to know what a good deal and a bad deal is for that property. And that's what I kind of talked about when you're planning to go sell a property and buy one kind of in the same time frame, is taking a week or two to window shop so you gain perspective on your target market and your target opportunities so you know what a good deal is and a bad deal is, what they list for versus what they sell for, will give you so much more confidence as a buyer to go out and make offers that you know are fair deals. Because like, look, like I know water the region. My partner, Matt, knows water the region. I can go on the MLS right now and be like, this would be a good deal at this price. This would be a bad deal at this price for pretty much any property that's on the market. But me saying that and what I think is a good deal is much different than what a buyer would think is a good deal. And giving yourself a few weeks to really learn your market will dramatically improve your chances of success. And that goes into our buyer action plan right here on this first on this slide right now. Um, understanding where you're at in the process as a buyer, also understanding what you know and what you don't know um, before you even go out and start looking at homes is super important. Making an action plan will understand your goals as a buyer, whether you're buying an investment property or primary residence, whatever it's going to be, guys. And so you know, okay, well, I still need to do X, Y, Z before I even start viewing homes. And that's a really powerful thing that we found. A lot of people have reached out from our previous videos and we've had you know, a, a phone conversation or a sit down meet um, to go over their action plan. And that's typically starts with, you know, hey, Rebecca, um, you know, what is your goal with this property? Most of the time, it's either just primary residence or a relocation or an investment property, right? Okay, so what's important to you about primary residence? And then you work your way back. And once you figure out what's really important to you and what your long-term goals are, you figure out what your financing options are so you can go buy it. Um, I maybe I'll just stop that right now, Rebecca. I'll just put my hand up. Anybody that just has a, you know, a free bag of cash to go buy many, many properties, no financing in water the region. Uh, my phone number is 519-591-8419. But for the rest of you folk who need to have financing to purchase properties, financing options and understanding all of them, please for your own sake, look at all your options. You guys have had some great guests on that talk about mortgage financing, talk about buying investment properties and primary residence. And honestly, a lot of their advice is fantastic. Understanding all your options, like maybe looking at an alt A or a B lender that's a slightly higher rate, but will give you the purchasing power for the type of property you want in exchange for a little bit of a higher rate now, you can get a property that you're really going to enjoy. That may actually be worth it for you or even private financing options, depending on the project or the property or your appetite as a buyer. We just, we want to make sure that you as a buyer understand all your options on the table. I think this is really what I'm getting at and don't underestimate whether it's a more expensive or more complicated option or a lesser used option guys, doesn't mean it doesn't work for you. So we kind of, really stress as a buyer specifically to go really deep on what your goals are and what all of your options are. Cause then that goes into you're viewing the right properties, you're offering on the right properties. So you're not wasting your time when you're actually going out and doing the fun stuff. You know, you're going to explore the neighborhoods, you're looking at properties, you're, you're, you're learning about, you know, the locations, the features, the mechanical systems, um, and you're figuring out what a good deal is and what a bad deal is. That's fun. And finally, before we, we move on, Rebecca, um, I believe this has been said on the channel before, but speed to lead or speed is king is like, cannot be underestimated, right? Like if you're going out and buying a property, being able to view it right away and offer on it as quickly as possible, inherently gives you an advantage, right? So as soon as a property comes to market that you're interested in, go see it. And I can't tell you, you know, we probably get a handful of deals a year for ourselves and our investors and our clients, just because me and Matt, you know, there's two of us. So between the two of us, we pretty much view the majority of, you know, investment opportunities in water the region, whether it's a single family flip all the way up to duplex conversions and multi units, because we know, even if we don't think it could be a good deal, if offer day rolls around, 
and they got nothing, the listing agent knows that we buy investment properties or they know that we're looking for these types of properties. So if they don't have anything good on offer day, we're getting a call and saying, hey, you know, we can maybe get a deal done around this. What do you think? You know, sometimes they're up to lunch, but sometimes they're not. And one of the, like, actually the best deal we got last, one of the best deals, one of the best deals we got last year was because there was more offers on a competing property two blocks away and there was fewer offers on the one we ended up buying. And we got $25,000 under ask or $25,000 under market value just because there's fewer people available that had we not viewed it, we wouldn't have been able to put an offer on with confidence that day. So just, this is probably the best advice aside from getting an action plan in place as a buyer. Please, please, please view and be in a position that you can offer on properties quickly, please. Yeah, I love that advice. That is forever in real estate, like the best advice that you could possibly give. Uh, the other question that I, I'd like to ask here, and this kind of ties into both this slide and the previous slide, as you mentioned, financing and just having that confidence going into the offer is really important. Uh, you, you mentioned a strategy of selling first. So what are you you kind of prepping clients for sellers for in terms of that in between time so let's say there's mm. maybe not an extended closing date possible on the offer or you can't quite get those terms that you want and your properties don't line up in terms of the buy or the sell and because there's so much competition on the Very buy common. you sell your house now you have nowhere to live what what happens what are you kind of coaching people on because that's a real fear that i've heard from from sellers is well what if i sell my home and i've got nowhere to go <laughs> you're homeless guys matt and zach are kicking you on the street tough luck no shot um, that is a really good question and a valid concern. And that's why we typically recommend selling first for people that a have typically those types of sellers are people that have options. They'll say, Oh, well, you know, when Zach, I'll stay with my daughter or I'll, I'll stay with my folks. Um, you know, if, if we don't find something that matches up perfectly, that's actually really common. And what we found is actually more common is typically those people take too long to go and buy their next property and they're losing buying power because the market keeps increasing while they wait. So right. my recommendation for those people is one, do that if you have a backup plan, if the, if the, you know, the closing dates don't match up. If the closing dates don't match up, a lot of people don't necessarily understand how awesome bridge financing is. Bridge financing is amazing. Before I got into the business, I was like, oh my God, you can't carry two properties at the same time. That's insane. And I was very naive and not experienced in real estate at all at that time, but you can carry two loans. Say I sell your house tomorrow, but the home and it, you know, your home, you know, the sale closes June, let's say. Do, 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 do. We go out and we buy a new property and that closes July 1st. Well, it can't because it's a holiday. Let's say July 2nd. And you say, well, crap, you know, I got like 30 days in between closings. If you have firm deals in place, you can get bridge financing and it's super affordable. Like I can't, I can't say how much because it depends on the size of the loan and the time, but like it is much more affordable than you think. So, you know, a few hundred bucks or even a few thousand bucks to carry two mortgages to make sure that, you know, you can carry both of them and still get both deals is probably worth it in my opinion, especially if you're getting the home you want. So like super fair question, I would say, make sure you have a backup plan. So you have some, some family or some friends to stay with for a month or two, if you closing dates don't match up and two, talk to your mortgage broker and confirm that bridge financing options are available. That's actually something we do with our clients before they firm up on a sale. Right. So let's say you have your home sold, Rebecca, and you know, we're going to go buy, um, you know, we got a beautiful listing coming up in Dune South and Kitchener. Great. You want to buy that, but the closing dates don't match up. So before you put in your offer, we'll call the mortgage broker, email them the deal numbers so they can run a, a hypothetical scenario and say, yeah, you know what, if these numbers check out and this is what the deal actually ends up being, you can get bridge financing. It'll probably be between this much and this much. Does that make sense for you? So then you as a buyer can go make sure, yeah, you know, I can make that deal happen. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's one thing that people just aren't aware of or yeah. don't even think about. So I think some of these strategies are really important to talk about. Much and much more possible than you think. And I, I think like, I just want to encourage, and I did this on another video, I think when I was on with Corey is like, all these things are very, very possible. Like yeah. if you're thinking about making a move or building a portfolio or getting into real estate, like. I thought that this was like, you had to be superhuman to pull off these things. But the reality is like everyday people do this every day. Like you don't yeah. have, you're not, it's not like the smartest people in the world are pulling these deals off. There are products, finance, financing products available for you. There are solutions, contractual solutions available for you for purchase and sale agreements to give you options. 
Um, they're just not necessarily as common. That doesn't mean they don't work and they aren't used. So I just can't stress how enough, enough how possible, you know, making moves actually are. Just make sure they make sense for you. Love that. Um, oh, investing in real estate. Uh, for all my gamer friends out there, we got the Triforce in here. I was trying to think of a way to kind of incorporate some little bit more fun, make this more interactive. Um, side note, I'm a big video game guy. I grew up on the Zelda franchise way back in the day in grade school. So for any of our older gamers out there, we got the Triforce for investing in real estate in Waterloo Region here in 2022. And that is this financing and action plan. They're the base. They're the base of the pyramid of triangle. You need those things as an investor. If you're coming, if you want to work with us here in Waterloo Region or you want to be successful, in pretty much anything in real estate, knowing all your numbers financially, current assets, your cash flow, your income, you know, any other sources of income or assets that you can use to get lending will dramatically improve the chances of getting favorable lending as well as all the options on the table. The more options you have, the more deals you can look at, the more deals you can look at, the more money you can make or the more opportunity you can take advantage of. Right? Love that. Action plan too, guys. I didn't make plans before I got out of university. Like I had like, you know, to-do lists and stuff and I had, okay, well, I want to invest $5,000 this year. I want to save this much this year. Like I do not, I do my own little budget, but like getting in, running my own business, um, investing more seriously and, and becoming successful in my, my own business and my own investment portfolio, like having a specific plan, like I write all that down. I track it. I look at it pretty much every day. Right. And that stuff works like, Legit, this stuff works. So if you don't clearly have your goals set out, or if you don't know how to get your goals clarified, or you don't even know what that means, like come talk to me. Like building an action plan is something that we've done with hundreds of clients. Uh, and the ones that are successful are the ones that look at the action plan and get very specific on all of the details, how long things should take, what happens if I do X or Y, and the steps that would follow that. These are all things that we can talk you through and outline for you, but this would allow you to go to the top of the pyramid here where I say, where I put view and offer so that you can view an offer with confidence, right? So the biggest thing that people have been reaching out for us are Zach, I'm looking for this type of property. And my first question is, okay, well, what's your long-term goal with that property? And then you kind of get the, uh, um, you know, cash flow, And I'm like, yeah, great start. But also if you buy that property, can you still afford to go out and buy another one? Do you need another one? Do you need monthly cash flow or do you need equity? So then you really start to get the wheels turning. So investors I just and, and, and buyers and sellers in general, I just caution you. Yes, think of your end goal, but also get clarification on what your end goal really is and how to get there. Then you can start going out and looking at properties and you can make offers with confidence because you know that if you offer on this type of property at this price point, it's going to get you to this goal. If you don't have that goal clarified, you're kind of putting the cart before the horse. Yeah, I love that. And any gamer fans, make sure you drop some comments for Zach What's your in game? the comments section below. What's your game? What is your game, guys? <laughs> what is your game? I mean, usually my gaming season's kind of over. Usually that's like December when you're off for a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. That's where I kind of get to get caught up. So, um, you know, maybe next year, guys, or at the end of this year, we can hop on and do something. Um, Zach, you're going to have to like post your like gamer names and stuff so everyone could game with you. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know if they want this heat. I don't know if they want this heat. I grew up, <laughs> I, grew, I grew up gaming. So and now I'm an, in, now I'm an independent business owner. I got stuff to do, but, uh, yeah, I think that'd be a fun time. I think that'd be a fun time. <laughs> um, okay. So who can invest Rebecca? Um, everyone psych. Um, not everybody can invest guys. Uh, Waterloo region has lots of options. I think there's still a ton of room. Um, I am still investing in the Waterloo region. What I want to kind of get through here is um, a lot of the people that we've done um, business with, you know, in the last five years, the people who have purchased property or have owned property in the last five years. Um, you know, at the beginning uh, of this video, we talked about how, you know, much prices have gone up, right? How much values are increasing. We do expect them to continue to increase in the long term. But um, a lot of these people have purchased a property and they've probably doubled, even tripled in value. Uh, and they're like, yeah, well, I got a small mortgage. Why don't I just keep paying that off? That's great. Be a great little saver. But if you want to take advantage of an opportunity using the equity that you have built into your home because you've held onto it or you've improved the value to either go buy another property or to fund another property or project or to partner with an investor or a contractor can be an incredible way to build wealth. 
right? If you want to be hands-on and you want to be the owner and you want to take the responsibility, then fantastic. Go out and buy a property, be a property manager, get that hands-on experience so that you know how to communicate with tenants, investors, agents, excuse me, then you understand kind of the whole process that will help you become a wise investor and help you understand where you fit into kind of the investor chain long-term. But like, if you're not interested in that and you still want exposure to real estate, you know, use your equity to, to, you know, be a private lender or get involved with other projects or be a silent partner. Um, the reality is I think there's still a ton of opportunity in real estate, super biased coming from a real estate agent. I get it. Um, but before I was in real estate, I, I was into, I was into the stock market and investing in equities and that's what I wanted to do. And I still do that. But I just think that for most everyday people, let's say that, you know, normal people like myself, the idea of investing in real estate is much more real and possible. And again, I just want to stress how real and possible it is. So if you've purchased the home or you own real estate for you know last five years or more, you could have a large margin of safety and equity built up in your property. And even if you access even a portion of it, not necessarily all of it, you can get some great opportunity in real estate. Um, and there's a lot of different ways you can do it. So just food for thought for people who are considering, um, get in touch or watch some of the other videos on the Canadian real estate channel. Like there is, a wealth of knowledge that you can can gather from that on how you fit in. Um, coming from other markets though, Rebecca, so a large influx of investors have been coming from you know the GTA for probably 10, 15 plus years, especially as the GTA markets have gotten significantly more expensive. A lot of these people are people that either sold properties in areas like Mississauga, Brampton, Oakville, Toronto, you know, we have people coming from Oshawa, Pickering as well. Um, they've either sold property or they've refinanced or they've sold their investment properties there to get better yields in our local real estate market. Um, they're coming because we still have cash flow positive properties. You can't cash flow positive a single family home typically, um, but duplexes, triplexes, a lower multi units that you can still get res a financing for guys, they still cash flow here. Um, so, and the cap rates are, you know, a lot better than the GTA from what I've seen. Um, so there is still a lot of opportunity but coming from other markets provides some challenges. You know, you can't necessarily view all the properties. So you may have to FaceTime in or do video chats or have an agent or a partner that you have that's local view them for you. Um, or you just don't know the areas. So you're trusting somebody on what's a good location and what's not. Um, there are some barriers that you have to, to kind of overcome. But if you're coming from the GTA areas or you're coming from Southern Ontario, if you're within an hour's drive, come up for a weekend, come up for a day, Go power shop with us. Go look at five, 15, 10 different opportunities in different neighborhoods and different markets. So you kind of get a better feel in the lay of the land for what you like and what you don't like in the local market. Even like a four hour trip. We've done this lots of times, honestly. A lot of our weekends are taken up by you know people that are coming from out of town. So we can set up like a three to four hour window and go view a bunch of different properties so that they can figure out if it's even an opportunity for them. Um, doing your research and taking that, you know, one or two trips down would be worth your time to figure out if these are opportunities for you, but people who have owned real estate in other markets or built up equity, uh, a lot of them are coming to the water the region and I can see why. Um, and finally just partnerships, dividing and conquer. I am, I, I have real estate partners. I have other business partners and other businesses. Um, I'm a big believer in partnering with the right people. Um, you can go a lot further with the team than you can by yourself. And it's a great way to take advantage of your natural skill set, uh, as opposed to trying to do a little bit of everything. So I think that'll kind of go into to our next slide. But you know, obviously, you know, a lot of the you know yourself too, Rebecca. A lot of people in the Canadian real estate channel, you know, you guys are big believers in partnering with the right people uh, and and getting the right team behind you. Because um, at the end of the day, you, you can't you know you can't do everything if you want to scale. Uh, so setting up the right partnerships and the right team can really help you guys. So if that's something you guys have questions on. We've helped partner buyers. We've helped partner silent partners and active partners, um, JV partners, um, equity. Like there's there's lots of different ways you can you can do it. So um, you know don't be afraid to make friends and make the right partners. Right. Absolutely. And don't underestimate your value either. Like I think finding those partnerships and as you said, like bringing something unique that you're super good at and just doing that thing that you're super good at is so valuable, whether or not it's finding the deals, analyzing the deals, doing the active 100%. work on the deals, like just talk to people who are also trying to work towards the same goals. And I freaking love working with partners. Like it is the best way to accelerate your business quickly. I, I can't imagine doing it all alone. It'd be so boring. I just get so lonely, you know? Yes. I love having, I'm, you know, a good, obviously Matt is a very, my partner, Matt Phipps, a great friend of mine, but yeah. like 
honestly, we have a ton of fun. And I think, you know, the, the investing community is, is, is generally very positive and very helpful. Yeah. So, so don't be a stranger, you know, get in there and mix it up. Absolutely. I love, I love making friends. It's always way better friends. that way. <laughs> I know this, the, the COVID stuff has kind of put a little bit of a damper on that for a lot of us, but um, you know, I think we're coming out the other side of this and um, yeah, we had a really good turnout last year too. When we had the investor meetup, we met a lot of really great people and it was just like really refreshing to get in the same room with other people that were like, yeah, I could invest in real estate. It's pretty cool. So that's a ton of fun. The good that's stuff, Rebecca, though. The good I mean, we need, stuff. I, I need to get a sound. We need to get a soundboard. So get the drum roll. That would be so cool. <laughs> so soundboard, drum roll. We're hitting the, we're hitting the symbols now. Here is the value. You know, um, this is primarily for investors um, and anybody that's looking to move into the Waterloo region and maybe move into a property that would be considered an investment property. Where are we seeing value in Waterloo region, guys? Um, duplex conversions. So uh, this has been a super hot topic. A lot of people in other markets are talking about duplex conversions and executing on them. You know, these have been really common in Waterloo for about, well, they've been common, let's say for 10 years, but really common for the last two or three years. Um, there's still room in duplex conversions. You can still make money on duplex conversions. Purchase prices for those lots and those properties have gone up dramatically, but I see these as great opportunities for investors that can put the sweat equity in. My very first investment property was a duplex conversion. Uh, I'm not a handy guy. I'm a keyboard warrior, but like I got in there and saved myself tens of thousands of dollars by doing a lot of the dirty work, a lot of the unskilled trades and unskilled labor. And it was a ton of work, but an incredible learning experience. I know so much more now and I know what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, what I like and what I don't like and how to really put a project together. So if you're somebody that's hands-on, if you're somebody that has extra time or has a skill set or the ability to, to go in and organize a project, two best conversions would be an even better option for you because you can drive your costs down, right? Now, for people that are looking to put the sweat equity in, fantastic options. For people that are looking for more hands-off projects that you don't want to get into a big project, you don't want to manage or hire a GC, then maybe I would look at other options and we'll get to that. But sweat equity is a really, really good opportunity for you to learn as an investor and will dramatically increase your chances to succeed long term, I think. Above and beyond that, duplex conversions can be fantastic options for people that are doing the work because you know how the project is done. You know what's behind the walls. You know how it was put back together. You know the quality of the space. So if that's really important for you and you're just dipping your toes into investing in general or you want a little bit of exposure to Waterloo Region without taking on you know, a multi-million dollar project, Duplex conversions, still a great way to go. We still hunt those, we still offer them, we still buy them and still have clients that buy them. So great option. Now we're sprinkling a little bit of extra sauce on top. That's the tiny homes with a money sign S there. Tiny homes with a duplex or duplex conversion with a tiny home, even better. You drive your cost per door down dramatically because it's cheaper to build the tiny home than it is to buy a brand new unit up front. Awesome way to build in a margin of safety and add an extra, you know, hundred to or fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in equity just by force appreciation and inherently changing the property to essentially a triplex, right? Duplex plus a tiny home in the back. Um, they're fantastic options. Again, just as competitive as duplex conversions, um, so you will have to compete for them. And but there is still lots of room to, for money to be made there. And I still think that there's especially a lot of key neighborhoods that will appreciate very well in the future, but offer cash flow positive properties if you're able to duplex them or duplex them and put a tiny home. So opportunity there, best opportunities for those are people who can put in the sweat equity, can drive down costs or want to learn the entire process of constructing a, you know, a legal two unit or three unit property. Um, I mean, you don't have to have construction experience. I did it with zero construction and renovation experience. I pulled it off. So it is possible if you don't have that experience, but you want to learn, highly encourage those deals, guys. Um, yeah, I love tiny homes. I just think that that's going to be like the next big thing. I, I want to, and it already is the next big thing, but I... I think in, in some of these markets where the city is actually very open to working with investors and increasing the amount of doors, increasing the amount of units, it's huge, right? Because you're mm -hmm. both solving the, the city's problem and you're also so solving your cash flow problem. So I love that. Yeah. The, the very first property that I duplexed, um, you know, I'll likely refinance the, the duplex and then use the, use the equity to, to go put a tiny home in the back and then refinance yeah. it again. 
and nice. my cash flow will remain positive, no money out of my pocket. And now I took a legal duplex and I basically made it into a triplex. My cash flow per month is actually going to go up. Sweet. Love that. So if you guys are sitting on property or if you have a single family home and you're not sure you can convert it into a duplex or not sure you can convert it into a tiny home, get in touch with me and Matt. Matt has all of this stuff on lock. So we can basically go online and look at your property and be like, yeah, you know what? We think it's possible. Do a quick site visit, explain the few steps, and then you can decide if you really want to take it from there. Um, we've had a lot of those calls um, and been really helpful. A lot of people are starting to jump on those opportunities. So that brings me to the last two points, key neighborhoods. Now, people from Waterloo Region, you know, you'll have your opinion on what the, you know, the great neighborhoods to invest in are going to be. For those of you that have no freaking clue, this would be a good opportunity to get in touch or come down and do an evening or a weekend of window shopping, right? The reason I want to bring this up, Rebecca, and for all the listeners out or viewers out there, appreciation over cash flow. Is it better to invest in, let's say, a premium neighborhood and forego and pay, let's say, a higher price and forego positive cash flow? Or should I still be investing in cash flow, right? I want my cake and eat it too. I want the good locations and I want positive cash flow. Call me greedy, but that is still an option. I would still take cash flow positive properties. They're still out there. I would not bank on appreciation yet. You know, when you start banking on appreciation to make your investment, your real estate investment, um, you know, numbers work, you're becoming a speculator. You're no longer investing. A, a lot of people in, you know, in more expensive markets like your Vancouver's, like your Toronto's, like your New York's, right? A lot of people that are big time investors there, they're banking on the appreciation. But for the majority of investors, the majority of people that watch videos on this channel, you cannot bank on appreciation. You're likely going to need positive cash flow to scale your portfolio and increase your, you know, basically your buying power to go out and buy something else as well, if that's what you want to do. As well, you probably can't afford or don't want to afford shelling out money out of your pocket or your savings account just to carry a property. Right. So, yes, there are key neighborhoods, but I do still think there's cash flow positive properties and po cash flow positive opportunities in those areas. So focus on the, the, the premium locations. Right? I don't even have to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Rebecca, hate me for it. Location, location, location. You can uh, no. do it. I know. I know you had to do it. But like, guys, the good locations are, are definitely worth if you can get them at a fair price. And again, you need to become a little bit of a local expert or, you know, trust a local expert to advise you on that if you don't know it yourself. Um, because there are a few key locations that we're really focusing on heavily. Um, and that's something that we're directing some of our investors and our clients to as well. Um, finally, though, multi-units. Guys, um, multi-units are still available, specifically more so in Kitchener and Cambridge. Most of the multi-units in Waterloo are, there's a lot of student rentals as well. So yes, there's still money to be made in student rentals, different type of investment and not something that we have added to our portfolio. Uh, we think there's more opportunity and there's more favorable opportunity in locations like Kitchener and potentially Cambridge. They're more open and, and willing to work with investors, i.e. tiny homes doing duplex conversions. They're, you know, they're city, city planning and inspection to, uh, inspectors in Kitchener um, are a little bit more open for business, if that makes sense. Um, and so we focus on the multi-units in Waterloo Region in general. They are still cash flow positive. There's still room to burr them or force appreciation. And here's the kicker, most often than not, the zoning and the lots will allow for future improvements, i.e. adding garage space, adding lofts, adding additional units off the back or detached off the back, adding additional parking as well or storage space. Like all these things are very possible because a lot of multi-units were you know, all brick built, purpose built, or they're all brick builds downtown on decent sized lots where that have the proper zoning to allow you to add additional units or to add additional structures that you can increase your cash flow, storage, putting additional units in the basement. There, there's lots of things you can do. So we've just really focused for a lot of our investors on the multi-unit game. We think there's a ton of opportunity still there and we still think there's a ton of opportunity for people that wanna buy and hold long-term or active investors that need to force appreciation. So if those are the types of investments that you need to either force appreciation and burrow them, so you need to you know rinse and repeat, or if you need some buy and holds long-term, just sit back, kick back, let the units turn over, collect your rent, turn it into a cash cow. I mean, last four days, we've had a client um, secure like a 10 out of 10 condition triplex downtown Kitchener, and then an eightplex downtown. It's a different client picked up an eightplex downtown Kitchener um, yesterday. Um, two totally different plays, but both great long-term holds. 
Um, one can be bird. The other one's just going to be a sit back and collect the cash um, and then utilize appreciation to refinance if they want to. Otherwise, just maintain the unit um, and there'll be cash cows for them. So multi units are, are still a great play and something that we would encourage to look at, you know, a little bit more seriously for any investor that's thinking about coming to water the region. Absolutely love that. Awesome. So we're going to end with this, Rebecca. We have an investor hot list. So for our you know, investors that are either actively looking or considering coming on down and getting a piece of water the region before it's too late, we have an investor hot list. You're going to go to fishbrittonrealestate.com slash contact. There is an investor tab. You're going to share a little bit about your investor experience, your goals, share your contact information, and we'll set up a follow-up to better understand the types of deals that makes more sense for you. This is a very good way for investors to get exposure to the water of the region real estate market. What investments myself and my partner, Matt, I think are good deals and accelerate your learning curve. A lot of people on this YouTube channel are understanding, you know, which of the markets are best to invest in, where should I be deploying my capital? And this is probably the best way for you as an investor to get an idea on one, do I, do I invest in one of the region? Is this the right market for me? And then two, what are the good deals in one of the region? So if anybody that's watching this video or on the channel is curious about those topics, fipsbrittonrealestate.com. The link is on the slide. We'll put it in the description as well. Contact us page, select the investor tab, and we will follow up with the information that you're going to need after we clarify what your goals are and what your financing options are. This is a very good way for you guys to get exposure and accelerate your learning to see if one of the regions right for you. Love that. Awesome. Well, do you have another place that people can reach you or follow along on your investing journey? Oh. Absolutely. Absolutely. We do have our own YouTube channel. We are releasing videos there, but for people that are on the social media game, we will have links to our social media accounts, primarily our Instagram. We are the most active on that. And it's a great way to share the properties that we're looking at our listings and the deals that we're analyzing on that uh, as well. You can go to my personal Instagram. I share a lot of stuff on that as well. It's just Zach.Britton. Super easy to find. We will put links in the description for you guys. And I know the Canadian Real Estate Channel will hook you up, guys, with links on this video so you guys can follow along and interact. We're super active on our DMs. We're happy to hop on a phone call and connect and answer some questions. Um, you know, we understand as people that are doing research and investors and people looking to get in the market, um, you need access to the right information. So we want to make sure we're available for you. I love that. Well, Zach, thank you again for coming on to the Canadian Real Estate Channel. Make sure you guys reach out to Zach and also hit up the comment section with your favorite game. We are <laughs> active in the comment section. I'm expecting some games. I'm looking for a new game suggestion if anybody wants to get on. Again, may have to wait for a while because we're going into our busy season, but I think that'd be really cool. Absolutely. Awesome, Zach. Thank you again for coming on to the Canadian Real Estate Channel. It's been a blast. And uh, I will be down on your, in your neck of the woods uh, coming up probably in March. So we're going to have to connect. And you got to sign me up for this investor hot list. Let's go. I'm looking forward to it. As always, Rebecca, great to see you and the rest of the viewers on the Canadian Real Estate Channel. Looking forward to connecting soon. Awesome, guys. Thanks again for tuning in. Make sure that you drop some comments for us down below. Smash that like button. And you haven't, if, if you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe to the Canadian Real Estate Channel for more amazing content like this. All right, we'll see you on the next one. Peace.